Good morning and welcome to Loyalty Leader Insights. Uh, I'm David Feldman. I'm chair of the Loyalty Summit. Uh, wherever you are in the world, welcome. Hopefully it's not too late for you wherever you're listening from. I am joined by two fantastic guests today. We'll get to them in just a moment. But this week's topic is an interesting one. Rewarding your highest spending customers versus incremental revenue. What are the segmentation best practices? Now, it's a bit of a controversial topic title because it suggests that there's some kind of trade-off or competition between higher revenue customers and incremental revenue. I'm not quite sure 100% that that's the case, but we're going to quiz our guests and see what their thoughts uh, on the matter are. And to our guests, we have Alan Myers, who's the former VP of loyalty at Virgin Atlantic. Um, and uh, since he's not been with Virgin Atlantic, he has been very, very busy in the loyalty industry. Um, and maybe we'll hear a little bit more from him uh, over the coming weeks about some of the other interesting projects he's been working on. This topic's interesting. Because as we think about all eyes being forward towards coming out of the crisis, if you're a loyalty program manager and you're thinking about, am I going to retool my program or am I going to tweak it? Am I going to reapproach it? Or even just the fact that my historical data sets no longer apply right now. Um, it's a great time for a program manager to be looking forward to be saying, how am I going to manage this coming out of the crisis? Use this as an opportunity to re-look at my program, really, you know, top to bottom. And today we want to focus on segmentation. Um, gentlemen, I'm going to have you introduce yourselves quickly and to give me your quick take kind of on the topic headline um, as we go forward. Alan, I'll put you in the hot seat first. Okie dokie. Thank you very much. I'm Alan Lias. Um, as my um, photograph suggests, I used to be uh, VP loyalty at Virgin Atlantic. I spent my career, my first part of my career at American Express, worked in the card business for about 10 years. Worked in the energy business for a while, did a bit of consulting, and then moved to Virgin Atlantic. And since Virgin Atlantic, have been um, uh, working as a consultant, primarily working with organisations that work with airlines. And I've done some other stuff in loyalty as well, uh, in different verticals. Um, I mean, this this whole area is is fascinating to me. Um, you know, it brings into play the big question, which is clearly airlines that have programs. Uh, invest heavily in their most valuable customers it makes a lot of sense. The definition of value has always been something we've wrestled with. Is it the value next year, the year after? Is it a lifetime of value? And how does that work? Um, and some people could argue we've overcompensated in terms of what we've done in terms of rewarding the best customers, and uh, to the expense of not only the long the long tail, but also the very valuable middle tiers. Oh, sorry, middle segments of the base in terms of frequency of usage. Um, and so I think, of course, now we're looking at a time where, you know, I was looking at BA's numbers, so IAG, IAG are flying 20% of the flights they were flying this time last year. So actually, to everybody's on hold, everybody's FFP status has been extended pretty much for a year, universally across all airline types. Going forward, frequency, value, a very valuable customer going forward might be quarter the value they are pre-COVID-19, but that's still going to be your best valuable customer. And in terms of therefore using a segmentation to some extent, you've got to start again. Um, and I don't know. I mean, if, if you think about, say, revenue management, who over year, years and year and year and year, they incrementally look at how routes perform, they use systems like pros, they've got all these forecasts, and occasionally something will throw it, like Easter's moved a week, or you know, there's an, ex there's an extra bank holiday in the UK because it's the Queen's birthday. Whatever it is, this is such a left field thing. We've got to relearn. So for me, the question about segmentation, higher value customers, it all goes into the same blend of what are we going to do next? There's a thought provoking questions you put in there, um, Alan. I think we're going to try to circle back to each of them because I, I think I'd like to explore those. Len, your quick take on the topic. Yeah, cool. So let me just quickly introduce myself. So Len Laguno, founder and managing partner at Kairos Insights. We, we kind of have a unique position in the, in the loyalty world because we're, we're actuary. As far as I'm aware, we're the only actuarial firm solely focused on, on loyalty programs. And so a lot of what we do is, is try to understand the actuarial value of customers, sort of their lifespans and, and how much they're worth over, over their lifespans. And so our, our approach to this idea of segmentation and whether or not you should, uh, be targeting high value members or, or mid tier members, I think just kind of falls by the wayside. We, we think about it a little bit more abstractly and just say, look, at the end of the day, we want to improve customer lifetime value. We want to grow customer lifetime value. And if I can grow customer lifetime value from high value members, 
great, let's do that. If I can grow it from middle value members, great, let's do that. If I can grow it from lower value members, fantastic, right? At the end of the day, it's just about growing customer lifetime value. Um, and our, our perspective on that is if you can grow customer lifetime value, what that means is the profit for the organization is going to grow and grow and grow, right? Uh, so so it's, it's really uh, a way to, to generate enterprise value if we're, if we're growing customer lifetime value. Uh, and so that's that's our bit of a bit of our perspective. So it really comes down to okay, can we quantify customer lifetime value with with a level of accuracy, and can that be useful for us in terms of our segmentation? And what kind of other metrics can we derive from customer lifetime value that helps us identify who are the members that we can um, effectively change behavior, right, and and drive up customer lifetime value? So that's that's a bit of our perspective. So it seems like less of a you know should you target high value members or should you not? Should you target low value members or mid tier members? Um, you know, it's it really we kind of reframe it just in the customer lifetime value view and, and trying to grow it. Excellent. Th thanks, Len. And I, I want to focus in on, on I think customer lifetime value is going to be an interesting topic for today. Uh, if you're okay with us uh, focusing yeah. in on that, um, you know, just just before we move on, though, I want to um, I want to kind of set the scene a little bit. I mean, as as everybody knows, um, airlines. Well, not just airlines. I mean, I want to be really clear about this. I mean, across the loyalty vertical spectrum, whether we're talking about retailers, coffee shops, hotels, airlines, there has been a zeitgeist over the last number of years, you know, uh, across the world, across regions, to focus on rewarding your best customers, rewarding your highest value customers. You know, the sort of language that we see bandied around, you know, whether it's at loyalty conference whether, you know, it's um, loyalty practitioners, some loyalty practitioners out there spruiking it, uh, some program managers, you know, or even just wordings uh, and verbiage in press releases. We, we hear about rewarding our best customers, rewarding your highest value customers. You know, we even have some advice out there in the industry about, you know, firing customers who aren't your top spending customers, you know, or designing your program, you know, and you only need to focus on your highest spending customers. Um, and I suspect that that's not right. It's not necessarily wrong. Um, I think, like most things in life, the answer is always it depends, isn't it? The nuance is in the middle, and and that's where I really want to focus on today. Before we get to the meat and potatoes, though, I do want to just do the quickly uh, quickly thank our, our sponsors uh, of the Loyalty Summit, uh, Engage People, Amy, Adara, fantastic supporters, um, and uh, we just want to acknowledge them. Also, our uh, official in-person events. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to hold those this year, but Hilton Honors is our official venue sponsor for Loyalty Summit in the Americas. Radisson Rewards, who has official uh, our who is our official uh, hotel and venue partner for um, Lordy Summit um, in Europe, uh, Travel Data Daily, who's our media sponsor. So we really want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, and I'm going to have more news uh, in a little while as well before we finish today uh, about very, very exciting about our next set of Lordy Summit conferences. Um, we are obviously going virtual this year, uh, which we've hinted at in the past, but I've got more details on that I'm going to share with everybody. But in the meantime, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the discussion. <clears throat> Gentlemen, to both of you, I want to put I want to throw out a premise, I'm not necessarily saying it's right or wrong. I want to just throw out um, a suggested premise and get your thoughts on, you know, whether you're aligned, not aligned, whether we need to pick it apart a little bit. But if we start from a premise that when you're designing program segmentation strategies or even just overall program design, it needs to be, everything you do needs to be about changing member behavior in order to generate incremental revenue. I'll say it again. Design your program so that it's about changing member behavior to generate incremental revenue. Um, agree or disagree, comments, Len? Yeah, so I think I would just modify it a little bit. On the whole, I, I agree. But uh, instead of saying to generate incremental revenue, I would say generate incremental profit. Um, you know, what, what we care about when, when we do our analytics is at the end of the day that we're gr growing the profit streams, the expected future profit streams. So by looking at the profit view, you're really um, able to make sure that whatever cost you're incurring to change behavior is less than the benefit that you're getting uh, in, in terms of the changed behavior, right? And so it, it ensures sort of a, a I, I, would, I would argue, a, whole, a more holistic economic view by focusing on the bottom line. A lot of the times uh, when, when you're thinking about behavior change, the points or currency is, is an incentive mechanism that's used at scale to try to change behavior. Uh, and so that cost of, of trying to change behavior comes in the form of redemption costs. And so you want to make sure that 
whatever redemption cost you're incurring by trying to try, drive this this uh, uh, behavior change is, is is much less than the, the the incremental revenue you're getting on top of that. And by looking at profit, we can ensure that. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you think about it, you know, incentivizing people to to, to sign up program and there's a you know you're giving them a, a point bonus uh well you know if you give everybody a million points and those a million points can be immediately redeemed without restriction for cash back um you know you're going to have a lot more people uh overcoming their objections whether it's at the register or on the website they're going to sign up but you're right if you know if your if your forecast and projections and calculations say that you know what only one percent of those customers are actually going to do any you know any profitable behavior for it in the future that's an expensive marketing campaign right. um and I think that that's where a lot of criticism of loyalty programs in the past has come from, hasn't it? Is, it, is that programs, especially uh, less mature programs uh, in earlier days, didn't really have their eye on the totality uh, of the cost over the customer life cycle. Uh, do you think, is that a fair comment that fits in yeah. what you're saying there, Lynn? Well, and I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, I've been in this space for a very, very long time, uh, for over a decade, working with many of the world's largest loyalty programs um, with, uh, you know, global hotel chains, airlines, uh, online travel agencies and whatnot. Across the board, I have not seen um, very, very sophisticated customer lifetime value models being deployed um, uh, at, you know, and, and, and used uh, extensively in the business, right? And I think that's, that's an area where uh, there's a lot of opportunity. These models are really, really powerful to paint that truer economic picture. Um, a lot of the times, you know, there, you've got people in finance just looking at the liability, looking at the cost, but they don't necessarily have their eye on the benefit that's being generated. And then there's people in marketing that are focused on the benefits and the top line revenue, uh, but may not necessarily care so much about about the redemption cost and how it's uh, and, and the liability and whatnot. Um, and so by bringing them together uh, through customer lifetime value and these sorts of models, um, you you get a truer economic picture. And you also align finance and marketing within an organization around the common view of how value is being generated, right? And I think that that can be really helpful because, you know, one of the biggest biggest barriers can be, you know, having skeptics in the finance department basically saying, look, I, I don't really believe in this loyalty thing. Um, I'm skeptical about it. I've got to worry about this liability risk and all of this. What kind of, what am I getting in return? If we can get them to see that value, then all of a sudden, you know, finance doesn't become a barrier, right? We can get them to buy in. We can get them to to invest more in the program, and and that reduces a lot of the barriers and, and helps loyalty marketers, you know, reach their goals and and grow the program like they want to. We've got a lot of program uh, managers that, uh, that that listen to us and watch us here here, Len, and I, I can see. Uh... You know, I, I, I can sense in the virtual chat a lot of head nodding um, going on with everything you're saying. And it's interesting because, you know, we had Mark Nasser and, and the guys from Air Canada on um, a, a little while back talk about the Aeroplan program, and, and, and they made a really interesting point. Mark, I mean, Mark made a very forceful point, and that is, you know, is that the single biggest barrier, to, to paraphrase him, please um, don't, uh, don't get mad at me if I misquote him slightly, but the single biggest barrier to achieving anything in Lord is IT. You know, it's it's IT barriers. So you know, you've got that conflict between finance and marketing, perhaps a misalignment there, um, which I think everybody's very familiar with with the challenges in that regard. But you've got IT challenges, uh, and then you've got analytic and uh, analytical and data challenges. Um, just in terms of not even actuarial, you know, projections, but historical um, ad analytics. And, and we've spoken a lot about bad data in the past. You know, I mean, there's 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 no shortage of material uh, in terms of there's a lot of talk about good data and analytics. Um, very few programs are doing it well. And even those that might be doing the historical side well, very few are then uh, evolving to that to that next level. Um, Alan, um, a ton of gold coming there from, um, from, from Len, but just to start back, the, 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 the comment of the premise, um, the Lordy program design strategies need to be all about changing behavior to generate incremental revenue. Len's comment that, let's tweak it slightly, generate incremental profit your thoughts i think len's absolutely right i mean it should both business is about profit loyalty programs are businesses and they are seeing themselves much more as businesses now quite right too funny enough i, I guess one of the benefits if there's a, if there could be a benefit um of a, of a terrible pan, from a terrible pandemic is that airline loyalty programs are becoming the heroes um they continue to generate cash um and they have in many cases been the substantive uh, collateral that has enabled airlines to go and raise a little more money. And, and the reason that, that they are able to do that, of course, is we know they're very profitable. And, and if we look at the, 
if we look at the, the basic segmentation, if you're an airline with a frequent flyer program, are they in the club, my members? Oh, sorry, are my flyers in the club or aren't they in the club? If we look at the in the club group, depending on how mature the airline is, depending on the kind of airline it is, anything from 30 to 70% of revenue will go through the program. So let's pick 50% as an average. What's happened over time is that airlines have got, apart from overcompensating um, the super frequent flyers, they've got stingier from a flying perspective in terms of how they reward from the basic earning perspective, how they um, reward mid-value and lower-value customers, and actually have leaned more heavily on partnerships to, gen to be responsible for the distribution of earning miles and points. Why? Without the distribution, of course, the programs have no utility. They're not useful. So the great news is if you are still a program manager out there that's still struggling to convince finance that it's all a good thing, first of all, the cash flow, everybody knows this. It's, if you sell a $1,000 ticket and you have to defer $25, so what? You've got the cash. And have we not learned from COVID-19, cash is king. Secondly, actually, what's even more, I suppose, exciting, back to this long-term uh, lifetime value piece, is in the end, what we all are trying to do at a program level is get people to purchase stuff with our products, whether they be a co-brand or whether they be in a merchant where I can earn my currency. That's what we're all about. So actually, the incrementality, as a consumer, I don't have to do anything incremental um, every day. I'm talking about outside the flying experience. As long as I start shifting my behavior from a, a vanilla co-brand to an airline co-brand, I've just suddenly become incremental. And as long as I do the maths right and let um, you know, an expert in doing the maths in relation to frequent flyer programs, as long as I'm doing the maths right and I'm making a, a profit on every mile issued, all I'm doing for the customer is getting them to a goal more quickly by them doing exactly what they're always doing every, every day of the week. They don't need to be incremental in their own right. They just need to be incremental in our direction, primarily through partnerships. And I think that's going to carry on. I think the number of miles earned through flying will continue to reduce. Um, the, the bargain between program and airline, in the end, the airline's not going to subsidize redemption. And the, in the end, the program's not going to give away miles below cost. But let's assume that there's an equation that there's a sweetheart deal between airline and program in terms of the costs. So everything else that's up for grabs primarily is around how you generate more cash from partners and then how do you use that cash wisely? So some of that cash you use to, to put to, into profit and some of it used to invest in shifting behavior from key segments. So what you've got, you've got stake money. And as long as finance and, um, and marketing are aligned on that, the good news then is one of the things that you need to be able to do the stake money, I never achieved this at Virgin Atlantic. We did a lot, very proud of what we did, but I never ever managed to persuade the airline to take some of the frequent flyer flying club profit and invest it in IT. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the new frontier. Canada are right. Mm -hmm. The new frontier is look, we need to take some of our profit and then give it to you, the airline. We need to take some of our profit and give it to winning incremental customers, whether that be on the ground or in the air. And we need to take some of that profit and invest in some of the mechanics, IT, and of course, as you mentioned, the ability to really understand and predict behavior so we can bring to life more effectively that investment in customer to make a profit to Lens Point. So it's, it's almost like a golden age for us, apart from nobody's flying and nobody's generating the income. We're, we're, on the, we're on the cusp of the golden age, Alan. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, but, but for program managers that still have, you know, that still have some functionality left in their teams right now, and I know a lot of programs are challenged right now, a lot of their teams are out on furlough, uh, you know, or have been laid off. Uh, you know, obviously nobody has a budget right now. Um, you know, it is a challenge, but if you're a program manager and, you know, you have some capability to even, to, even if it's tabletop exercises during this quieter time, I don't want to say downtime, um, you know, and you're looking to how do I maximize this so that we're positioned to come out of uh, this recovery strong, you know, and so that the brand can lean on us, you know, and we can deliver to the brand, you know, what are those, what those commercial goals are. Um, and, and it's a good point you say about being on the cusp there, uh, Alan, because I mean, Rob actually just in the chat reminds us, you know, it's a challenge, which can also be an enabler. Uh, and it's about if you can get it right. Uh, and I think, again, I think Air Canada is the poster child right now. I mean, this is, it's, it's a great story um, of, you know, uh, 
multi departments, you know, internal, external, good partnerships, good approach, getting getting the stars to line up. Because if you wait for the stars to align, nothing will ever happen. You know, you have to get out there and do the work. Coming circle, bring it all back to the topic, you know, um, and I think it's a good point. When we talk about incremental revenue, really we want to, in the bigger picture, we're talking about generating incremental profit, you know. Um, and when we're talking about changing customer behavior, you know, everyone has a bit of a vision in their mind. Everyone sort of has a, a, an implicit bias about how they perceive a frequent flyer program or a loyalty program, you know, whether you're talking about um, Starbucks or Gloria Jeans or, you know, a, let's see, Gap, who just in, in the US, you just relaunched, uh, let's not even go there. Um, I made some comments on LinkedIn if anyone wants to see that. Um, or a typical hotel or airline frequent flyer program. If you're a ma high spending managed corporate traveler, your view, or you're a salesperson who deals with, you know, managed corporate accounts, your view of what frequent flyers are and incremental behavior and incremental revenue slash profit looks like is very different to say a self-funded um, a self-funded, uh, self-employed frequent flyer, you know, who might spend a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars or pounds a year, um, you know, on flying quite a significant chunk coming out of their own pocket. They're making their own decisions. Every, all those people have very different views about what, you know, incremental behavior or change in behavior is. So, you know, Alan, you made some good points. If you are a program with a broad on the ground partnership of earn and burn partners, you know, to some degree, Okay, you're earning a few less frequent flyer points or miles from flying, but you're able to earn so fast on the ground and maintain a relationship from the time you wake up in the morning to go to bed at night to engage with the program and the brand uh, and be earning your currency, which you can redeem on those aspirational trips you're saving up for. You know, it's not necessarily the biggest deal. Now, when we look at the poster childs of this movement, you know, the, the US airlines who don't have those broad base on the ground earnings outside of their proprietary co-brand cards. Um, it's very different. It, it's very different because all the stock is in that credit card basket. Oh, oh, David. We, might have lost, we might have lost David again. You're frozen. I mean, one of the things I was going to say, if, if, if I may lend just a quick yeah. chip in there uh, on the back of what David said, having said it's a golden age, it's a golden age if you're a dominant airline with a dominant frequent flyer program. Yeah. You know, you take Australia, for example, okay? Um, you've got Qantas. You know what? Nothing is as person events, right, gentlemen? So you have to turn your webcams back on there. Oh, there we go. Gotcha. All right. Uh, sorry, Alan, I cut you off. You jumped in there. Go ahead. Now, what I'm saying is that, of course, what's going to happen now is the share of wallet becomes everything. So, you know, in the olden days, you, you know, take – Take the US market where you're giving $11 potentially for the super elite, you're giving 11 miles for every dollar spent. What happens to those miles? You get zillions of miles. And actually, if you look at the low value redemptions that are out there, if you look at gift cards and, and sort of conversions into hotel programs and into retail programs, people that wash with miles were, were just converting into anything, didn't care what the value they're getting. Mm -hmm. The sudden, they're not elite, you're not going to be earning that many miles. What well, my point being, Therefore, your may vest to so take the US. If you're a Delta, if you're a Delta member, you may vest more in Delta than shift some of your share elsewhere. If I take, I was mentioning Qantas and Virgin Velocity, a bit like Virgin Atlantic and B and BA, frankly, in the UK, is that the Flying Club was the second, usually the second program. So once you got in the BA program, the exec club, once you got to gold, then actually, because the product and service experience is probably better on Virgin often. Then you'll make that your second card. And actually, I'd like to get status on, on Virgin Atlantic, and I get status much easier. So my I'm spreading the love, if you like, between players. Suddenly, actually, I'm going to be flying a lot less, but I still want to be num somebody's number one. So I'm going to vest in, frankly, dominant program. The dominant program is going to be being attacked by this second program in a number of ways. One, there's going to be ridiculous opportunities to earn status in the second program for doing very little. B, there's going to be... And there's probably not going to be double miles, triple miles, quadruple miles, because we've always we've all learned it's a race to the bottom. An airline does it, we all do it, and it's a waste of money. But in, back to the corporate sales point, the corporate sales guys are going to be looking to lean on their corporate clients to try and win some market share. They're going to have to drop the levels to get the best deals, but their smaller, I guess, nipping at the heels competitors will be dropping even more. 
So actually, for the first time, probably since the banking crisis and more so, is there's got to be some harmony between, a lot more harmony between corporate sales and the program. And as you mentioned, the independent traveler becomes even more important. So that segmentation looks the same, but actually the, the, the way you then magic, well, hopefully affect behavior, it's not going to be pretty economically to hit lens profit target goal. I think we still can, but the margins for a while people are going to be coming down. And if we, and it's just a rate, unfortunately, it's a race for survival in that regard. No, I, I think that's all very true points, Alan. And uh, the point I was going to make when I cut off earlier is, you know, in, in the US market, you know, obviously the only non-flying you know, interaction generally people have is if you have the, the co-brand credit card. Um, but the problem with that compared to other markets, you know, like Europe, the UK, Australia, Canada, you know, where you have South America, where you have these broad based on the ground, um, I don't want to, I'll, I'll find, I'll use the word coalition partnerships. Um, I hate that word. Um the difference is, is in those markets, you know, you can, I, I always make the comment, you wake up in the morning, you go to bed at night, you can have those brand interactions all day long and stay connected with the brand and have that affinity for the brand. You know, you are shopping at the grocery store or the supermarket, you're thinking about, you know, your, your trip to the to the beach uh, with the family. You know, you are, you know, buying you are thinking about the trip to the beach with the family. Everything you do, uh, and that's why these partnerships are incredibly, um, you know, incredibly profitable. And some people will say U.S. airlines are really leaving money on the table by not having invested in growing those partnerships. You know, despite the fact that the U.S. market presents some some challenges compared to other geographies. When we think about segmentation, when we think about the various different segments, Alan, great pricey there on on some of the challenges facing with managed corporate right now. Um, just focusing on, on the US one more second, because Vasu Raja at American Airlines has been coming out with some, some really interesting commentary over the last six weeks. Um, we know business travel is down, you know, 85 to 95% down across the board. Managed corporate travel basically doesn't exist. I mean, this is not a US unique ish, issue. This is this is global. IATA just came out with some figures, I think, this morning, uh, which, you know, they're not pretty, but you're welcome to go have a look at those. Um, the reality is the only people flying right now from American Airlines perspective is leisure travelers buying the cheapest fares going to Florida uh, to go to go to the beach? Um, you know, now we're not going to make any comment on health and safety issues, uh, but other people can, can form their own opinions on those things. But what's interesting though is they have decided to basically gut their basic economy proposition. We talked about that in our last call. There's no more restrictions for elite members on basic economy. Um, the fare they were using people to buy up, they're now basically saying, you know, these leisure travelers, they're here, they're buying the cheapest fare instead of preventing them from being able to give us more money and buy up to additional ancillaries, we're going to allow them to do so. And Vasu has been coming out and saying, you know, talking about, we've got to get those people into the event and we've got to get them. Later. Whereas previously the program had taken a strategic direction in line with their competitors and every, all the other majors, the zeitgeist around the world to basically say, we're not interested in those lower value unmanaged leisure travelers. We're only interested in the top end of town. Top end of town doesn't exist right now. So when we think about segmentation along that whole continuum that we have of the customer base, and Len, with the lens of what you're saying about the long term, what's the customer lifetime value? And everything we want to do is about changing behavior, but with a view to long term incremental profit. And when we say changing behavior, let's think about those behavior points. You got to get the customer to enroll in the program. That's behavior change. You got to get the customer hopefully to buy a coffee, take a flight, stay in your hotel. That's a behavior change. Preferably, you want them to do that on a habitual, frequent basis. You want them to spend more money, you know, buying additional add-on products, uh, you know, take along opportunities. That's behavior change. And you want them, if they're spending $10,000 a year on airfare or hotels or coffees, whatever it might be, and you're only getting 2000 of that, they might, there might not be more incremental revenue for them to spend out of their wallet, but you want more of their wallet coming to you. That's yeah. behavior change. All right. of the, the, everything we do comes down to behavior change. How do we put all that together, Len, and apply that thinking about that customer lifetime value? Or let me put the question a different way. Across those different segments, how would your approach change? How should program managers be thinking about them differently? Right. So I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right around the, con the, the concept of, of behavior change. We want to change behavior. What's critical to, to recognize here is we want to change expected future behavior, 
right? I don't really care about changing historical behavior because I mean, I mean, you just can't, right? So it's 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 what's going to happen in the future, and when we, whenever we look into the future, it's always you always have to think about it probabilistically, right? You have to build models to predict, okay, what's my a priori assumption what behavior looks like right now, and then if I can change that behavior, say nudge them some way today to change their probabilities of behaving in a different way, that is in our view, behavior change. You've now changed the expectation of what they're going to do in the future, right? So, and, and CLV comes back into play here because CLV is particularly the future part of CLV. So if we're just thinking about the expected future profit generated for members, and of course, whenever we talk about profit, we're talking about profit net of redemption costs. It's a probabilistic thing, right? Based off of everything we know about you, David, or you, Alan, we can build a model to predict what's our expectation for what you're going to do in the future. And basically, our goal is to try to nudge you in certain ways to be able to change those probabilities to grow that expected future profit stream. And in our view, that, that's what we would consider incremental value, right? And so when, when you think about those segments that you laid out, and we'll maybe just simplify and think about those high spending members and everybody else, the high spending members, they already love you, right? We, our expectation for their expected future profits already tremendous. It's very, very high, uh, which is wonderful. But let's not forget, there's two things that we should remember about these, about these folks. They're about 20% of your members, and they're going to generate 80% of your profit over the next three years, three to five years, or just basically in the future, right? So it's very, very skewed, very, very concentrated. They really affect economic outcomes, right? So that's sort of fact number one we should keep in mind. Fact number two is while we expect them to spend a lot with you in the future and generate a lot of profit, that is far from guaranteed, right? So there's still probabilities there. So to whatever extent we can sort of nudge these people and show them some love and keep them happy to increase our probabilities of them coming back, or in other words, decrease the probabilities of them lapsing, that is still changing behavior, at least in, in our view, around sort of thinking about it probabilistically, right? So I think that there is an argument to make to say, all right, well, we should play a little defense with these high spending members, because if we lose their profit, that's going to hurt the business very, very hard because they, they own such a large share of the profit, right? So defense is an important way to think about it with these really high spending members. You can also play offense though with the high spending members, right? These, these people love you. They're, they're actually the easiest to upsell into like premium services and other things, right? So there might be some opportunities to grow them uh, even further beyond, beyond what they are today. Um, so it's kind of a balance of defense and offense. Um, when you start shifting and you start going down, um, you know, you have less and less share of wallet for, for these lower value members, right? There's more opportunity to capture more of that share of wallet. And so the predominantly you're going to be thinking about playing offense with these, with these other segments, right? And CLV again can help you understand how to do that, right? One, you know what their value is today. We want to try to grow it. The nice thing about CLV models is they're basically models that tell you, you know, based off of what we know today, like what are people going to do? So we can start leveraging those models to understand, okay, well, what levers can we pull that most influences their expected future behavior? Uh, and that could be really, really powerful to help you understand how you want to engage and who you want to be targeting uh, to, to try to change that behavior in, in, that, in that lower sector. It's, it's interesting. I like the way you put the offense and defense parlance there, there, Len, as well, because when we think about and again, I, I opened the session with saying, hey, it's a controversial topic the way the headline is written, but, you know, it's not necessarily, it shouldn't be an either or proposition. We shouldn't be saying we're only focusing on our higher spending customers, but we also shouldn't be saying, well, all of our higher spending customers are just locked in managed corporate travelers. You know, we don't need to worry about those because any dollar we spend on them is just subsidizing existing behavior. I mean, both of those are untrue statements. However, I'll rephrase, both of those are partially true statements. The question is, is we need to quantify, even if it's in a model, we need to quantify, you know, well, how many of our managed corporate travelers, they're, 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 they're locked in. There is no ability to move the needle. There is no ability to grow incremental add-on products or even influence share of wallet because the traveler actually, maybe they don't love us. Maybe they hate us. There's no emotional affinity with a large segment of that market, but it's an important segment, which is why sales programs, uh, invite-only benefits, uh, things like that, you know, uh, special other special corporate perks. We won't go into all of those. They vary, obviously, across airlines. Um, that's why those programs exist. Um, but as you say, there's a retention aspect, isn't it, what you call defense with uh, higher spending customers because some of them actually – they do have an affinity and they can influence the corporate uh, the corporate decision making if for no other reason than a major corporate 
if all their flyers are happy flying on airline A, when airline B comes knocking next year trying to win the business and the corporate travel manager might be thinking about switching, they don't want to have an uprising internally on their hands necessarily. So there's a little bit of defense there. Yeah. What I'm interested in is, is Alan, your view on what about the, what about, let's move off that segment. And you can pick whether we're talking about everybody else, as Len put it, or you want to kind of micro, you know, uh, down uh, other segments. Let's move off that segment a little bit. Uh, and I'm interested in terms of how do you feel as a program manager, you know, you need to think about them to try to grow them, get them up the ladder, because sometimes these, I'm going to call them mid-tier segments, you, maybe that's the wrong terminology, but, you know, not your lowest leisure travelers and not your highest managed corporate spenders. Those people in the middle, often there's a lot of emotional connection with the brand they feel very attached to it. they feel very offended when they're hard done by by the brand they don't necessarily spend thirty thousand dollars a year but they might be giving you a hundred percent share of wallet every year for 10 20 30 40 years that's how would how would you recommend uh programs should think about those and here's a curly one for you are there any kind of alternative strategies that we sort of haven't talked about so far that are maybe a bit out there that should be dusted off the shelf yeah, I think I think you're right. I think um, there's two groups actually that are of interest there. You've talked about the mid value, the mid tier, that are flight active but not able to qualify for elite. That are potentially partner act active because they're loyal. Potentially share of wallet, high market share for those customers from flying and and actually on the ground spend perspective, and yet they've been ignored. And 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 that there's another group of people who sort of actually. When I was at Virgin Atlantic and since leaving, I've been working with the team at Collinson developing subscription models for actually once upon a time you were the chosen one and you've suddenly stopped flying on corporate business, for example, or your, your company needs to fly you less, whether that's your own company or whoever you work with, and you're dumped. You know, unless you have been at elite level for a circa 10 years plus and you qualify for lifetime status, you're pretty much on your own. And so trying to solve for those two groups um, is, is potentially a subscription model. And that subscription model enables you, if we think we step right back, I mean, I guess Miles was the first ancillary. And if we go back 11 years, um, I think it was United that sold the first bag, uh, at least I'm at a, from a full service airline perspective. And of course, what ancillaries have shown us, um, or the ancillaries uh, strategies have shown us, is customers will pay for a better experience. Customers like choice and prepared to pay for that as long as they see the value. And actually, the best bit about that is if they pay for a service, they tend to love you more. So typically, the NPS score of someone who's either engaged in the program or buys a, an extra leg room seat, they love you more, even though they're giving you more. And so this idea of subscription I mean, obviously, everybody's very aware of how successful Amazon Prime's been. But what is the airline version of that? And how do we reward mid-value and high-value customers and charge them something? And I guess it does, to some extent, lean on how the ancillary movement has developed. But it also very heavily leans on two things. One, what do they want? And actually, what they want is similar to what they had. So the ex-elites want an elite experience. And what do people that have never been elite want? The mid-value customers. They want to be treated like an elite. For that to happen, though, and to have economics that support it, you need to charge them something. But, of course, you can be creative with what you charge them. So the kind of products construct we've been looking at are multi-price products, where there's a preferred price to recognize previous loyalty, and there's a retail price if you've just rocked up and you want to buy it. If you build the product right, so it includes some travel experiences and it includes mileage, but mileage bonuses, whether you're on the ground with partners or whether you're in the air, if you build the product right, it's still attractive to someone who's just turned up and joined your frequent flyer program. But you can demonstrate to those people that are the chosen ones, and I'll talk to you about that in one second, that you can get extra value. And that value is demonstrated by a preferred price. And that could be to the, as you say, David, it could be the, so the customer pretty much has always flown on this airline, but they're only flying once or twice a year. Let's reward them with this service. It could be a member that flies very rarely, but is spending twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on their co-brand card or a super engaged across the public network. Let's reward them 
but we need to put economics in there to make it viable. You know, I guess one of the things that, that strikes me is that if airlines today were starting from scratch, you'd actually make your elite program a paid tier, but you might give it at a discounted rate or a free rate for someone who's super, super active on the airline or indeed on partners. And I think that's the new model going forward. And actually, figuring out a way of getting someone to give you money to buy the right to have a better experience in the air and potentially through partners is so important at the moment. Because back to that point, there is a smaller wallet to win a bigger share of subscription done well and building on the experience we've had from uh, how we look after our best customers, but also how we economically make contribution as uh, evidenced by what we've done with ancillaries. And that contribution in the, in the, for the next one or two or three years probably needs to be heavily invested back in the customer. So let's not worry about making too much money out of it, but it should be profitable as well as obviously, hopefully creating a solid engagement platform going forward. And really, it's a question for me. It's a race. Who's going to get this done? Who's going to do it right? And then there's going to be a race to follow. But getting it done early and getting it done right, I think, is a massive strategic advantage. And the timing, possibly, given what's happened with COVID, could be better. And if this subject this is, is segmentation, a great way to do segmentation is ask your customer base, put your hand up, and tell, tell us who wants what, give us some money, and we'll give it to you. And, um, and that, I think, is, you know, is something that's going to develop over time. It's, it's it, you know, what, what you say, Alan, as, as you talk through a lot of that, you know, it's like most things in life, right? What's old is new again. Um, you know, I, I think back to some, some attitude um, analysis work, um, did, worked on uh, quite a number of years ago. I mean, let's go back 10, 10 15 years with Qantas, um, you know, looking at Qantas frequent flyers. Um, and what was interesting back then, of course, you know, obviously the program is a little less mature than it is now, you know, partnerships certainly there, um, not quite as, as developed and extensive as they are. I mean, same story around the world. What was interesting was club members, people who had paid the annual fee to be a member of the club, you know, and, and back then off the top of my head, 15 years ago, you know, it was still something like a $300, you know, uh, renewal fee every year. There was a joining fee. It wasn't cheap to be a member of the club. But back then, if we go back to 15, 20 years, you know, even back to the ANSET days in, in the Australian market, you know, and obviously the same in other geographies around the world, being a club member, you know, was a work, you know, was a valued experience. Uh, it wasn't just entry to the club. You got benefits associated with that that essentially approximated the lowest tier of status as well. So to some degree, you were paying a subscription fee, you know, you got club access, you were buying club access, and you were essentially buying... Uh, the lowest uh, elite tier level of benefits, but you were treated well. And every airline around the world that that went down this approach, this model, treated those members quite well. Those members felt very valued, even though they weren't by any stretch of the imagination frequent flyers, but they felt that they were some of the airline's most valued customers. So they gave 100% share of wallet to the airline. Often they had a very high attitude scores, um, you know, even if it was one flight a year but it was 100% share of wallet. Um, and now, of course, if you legitimately were an elite frequent flyer, what they did was, yes, you got free club access, but the way they actually structured it was technically what they were giving you was complimentary Qantas club access once you got to mid-tier elite uh, or higher. Um, so to Alan's point about, well, maybe what you do is you'd structure that everybody pays, but you give a discount or free uh, for, for genuine frequent flyers. When thinking about those more infrequent flyers, you know, thinking about CLV um, model or approach or even just designing your program coming out of this crisis with a view to the fact that, you know what, the people flying right now are leisure flyers, they're infrequent flyers, let's get them in. To Tavasi Raja's point in America, let's get them into the family, bring them inside the tent. If you're a program manager, you don't really have uh, a mature or any CLV model right now, how would you start looking at that segment of customers and building a strategy out for the future so that, you know, I don't want to say extract every dollar available from their wallet, that's not really what I mean, but so that you can bring them in, grow their affinity for their program in the airline or the hotel, whatever it might be, um, and get them to climb up that relationship ladder with you, which hopefully then involves higher spend and higher frequency. Yeah, for sure. 
So the good thing is every single loyalty program has the data to be able to do very sophisticated customer lifetime value models, right? It's all tons and tons of history of transactional data uh, allows you to really understand long-term behaviors, right? Um, and, and so there's, there's sort of three things that, that we would suggest that, that you've got to do to be able to build these, these correctly uh, at a high level, right? First is it's got to be predictive. Too many people are building CLV models, but they're just looking backwards, right? Which is helpful, certainly. But the real value for segmentation purposes isn't what they did in the past, but it's what they're going to do in the future, right? And how valuable is that behavior? Uh, so it's got to be forward looking. It's got to be predictive. Uh, the second thing is it's got to be at the individual member level. A lot of people have CLV models and maybe they're forward looking, maybe they're not, but it's just an aggregate, right? It's an average population average. It says, okay, on average or population, or even maybe at a tier level. And you say, Hey, my gold and my platinum tiers have this CLV. My base tier doesn't has this other CLV. Again, sort of helpful and, and certainly better than nothing, but if you really want to get the power of customer lifetime value as a segmentation tool, it's got to be at the individual member level. You got to build the models to look at everything you know about an individual member and make a prediction about how much profit they're going to generate for you over the next several years in the future, right? So that's sort of the second component. The third component, and this is really critical for loyalty programs, um, and it's different than you know other industries. It's got to be net of redemption costs. Redemption costs are, I mean, the points aren't cheap, right? It, that's a material component of, uh, of, of the economics of, of a loyalty program. It's probably the single largest expense, right? And so you got to make sure you're subtracting out the expected cost of all the points that you're issuing to that member so that you're truly looking at, at, uh, at, a, at a bottom line profit number. Uh, and when you start taking in net of redemption costs, you're suddenly in a position where you can start understanding the relationships between, hey, redemption behavior and long-term revenue generation, and, and then look at the bottom line profit that, that ensues, right? Uh, and once you understand that relationship, you're in a better position to understand what leverage you can pull and how you can influence that and, and, and identify the members where, hey, this guy, maybe if I gave him some more, some more points or if he earned some more points or if I gave him a rich offer, that additional set of points in that person's, in that person's bank changes behavior in a very profitable way compared to say maybe somebody else that got the same offer had more points in their bank it didn't it didn't change their top line revenue that we're expecting it just increased their cost right in that situation that's not that's not nearly as good you don't want to target that person nearly as much as you want to target the first person where the points actually really change behavior so when you start getting into these sophisticated clv models where you understand cost and benefit trade-offs you can do more intelligent um, targeting of members based off of who are the ones that are most responsive to points that are most likely to change behavior in a profitable way because of points, right? And that can be tremendously helpful. You know, and, and when we think about, I mean, use the term earlier, nudge, nudge, nudge the behavior, you know, because you've got, say, someone in segment 22, uh, right, you know, who, you know, has an expected, uh, expect future expected value of, you know, I was going to make it up, $1,000, right? Yeah. And then you have, I want to get them to free, you know, because that moves them up to a fifteen hundred dollar EV. I'm oversimplifying this, right? But what you want to do then is design. Once you've got that data, you've got that model. You can say, well, all those people that fit that avatar of segment twenty two, right? I'm going to now devise more tactical offers or a suite of benefits, whatever it might be, to engage with that segment of the membership base to incent them to change their behavior. Right. Simply to nudge to the next segment uh, up the ladder. I mean, is that, that's at the base level, that's what we're trying to do. Is that right, Len? Yeah. And then if you, if you're successful at doing that, you're, you're suddenly in the position where you're, you know how to very directly nudge people to higher levels of CLV, right? If you're nudging them higher, higher level CLV, nobody in the organization is going to be like, I don't want that. Right. Like, so it's, it's, it's a very clear benefit that you're going to be getting if, if you're able to do that sort of at scale uh, and very intentionally. Right. And, and this is a this is a challenge that we we all know. I mean, the loyalty program managers that we all deal with, the programs that we've all been in, um, they all have this challenge, and that is the program is always needing to justify itself to the rest of the organization, whether because they need finance to you know to, to buy into the concept of loyalty, or whether they need operational divisions of the company to get on board to make sure they're delivering that top level experience to members and why delivering that top level experience to members at the front line is important. You know, if you're trying to get a minimum wage, you know, hotel front desk associate to understand what do I need to make sure I'm nice to this member and make sure they get their breakfast benefit, well, there's a very, very, very 
big commercial reason why that's important. You know, and just because they're a minimum wage front line uh, front desk hotel associate, I think it's important for those people to understand the bigger picture. And I've always found the frontline staff, whether it's a, a coffee shop or an airline, when they understand the bigger picture, they have more buy-in. They understand the importance of how their actions can make or you know um, the customer the customer experience. Alan, there's a question for Paul in the, in the chat, which is good. I think it's a nice segue here uh, as we move into our uh, kind of final turn. Um, could a CLV model be shared with the airline to personalize the ancillary offerings uh, to flyers? I mean, there's a little bit of that that goes on already, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a great question because I think that is apps future. It's one of the things we talked about in one of our previous chats was this idea of total relationship. You know, it, you know, the Coke brand is a great example. You walk around every day of the week. You're getting out every maybe more than once a day. You're getting out the airline brand, and you're de demonstrating your affinity to that brand as you spend in, in shops. Um, you know, the the economics of the partnership business should absolutely be part of the calculation of of value, as should the propensity to buy up an experience. And actually, as should responsiveness to marketing messages, as should, of course, the core flying. Because you know, in the end, our, there, are, a, 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 there is a very discreet bunch of frequent flyers that will fly with you and be super valuable for years and years and years and years and years. But generally speaking, the population of that group is defined by the job you do and the position you have in an organization. Even if you run your own company, you, know, you might get fed up with it after a while, being the, the guy that has to do all the deals. You might, get, you might want to delegate a bit, but certainly in big corporates, you know, it's typical a three-year thing, you know, often less, but someone's gonna be invested in a, 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 a destination for a period of time or a set of destinations served by one airline. It has and often comes to an end. And so back to the sort of point almost about subscription, subscription would be another investment that I'm making <coughs> that hopefully would go into a predictive model that would help me and Len define a strategy thereafter for taking that person to whatever next segment segments are attractive. So, so <coughs> sorry, excuse me, um, you know, absolutely that total relationship and I think that's where it has gone wrong and still has gone wrong a little bit between the relationship between program and airline. Um, it should, it's a brand play, the, the, the frequent flyer program, the airline launch program. It's a brand play. And, and, and it needs to be seen as that. And it's not just about the economics. Is it good business? Am I displacing revenue? What's the true cost of redemption? What's the true margin? Blah, blah, blah. It's actually much more than that um, because... It is about this this total relationship that we have, and the lifetime value. You know, there's, there's a, by definition the, the word lifetime. The great thing about travel, it's so shiny and lovely. Even if you travel loads and you have to go for work, and you don't want to do the short, the short. You do short haul for business, and you hate it. You often want to reward yourself and your family with a long haul, gorgeous trip. So our assets are our destinations. Our assets are. And if you've got enough miles, the product, the, 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 the experience you'll get at the front of the plane. That is, we're so lucky to have that. Mm -hmm. So leveraging that across the total relationship we have from, from when you are 21 or whatever it is, 18, 19, 20, 21. We saw it at Virgin Atlantic, we hated it. First thing that happens is idealistic students fly on BA, they get a few points, they fly again, suddenly they're silver, and they've gone to the dark side. They've gone from socialists to capitalists. And they are on they're on the they're on miles drugs and trying to get hold of them because Virgin Atlantic in that example, a very small airline, 35 airplanes, niche. You're not part of that life. So muscling in there's really tough. But that's the deal the deal. So if you're a full service airline with a dominant position, your program is the key because actually the fundamentals are there to have a lifetime relationship, unless they completely move to another country or whatever. I think, I think that that's a good point to finish up on, Alan, is, you know, everything we talk about, we, we can we can get lost in the weeds, you know, focusing on our redemption metrics, our engagement metrics, all, all the rest of the business. You know, and all those are important. They're not unimportant. Um, we don't have jobs if uh, if we ignore them. But ultimately, the system works 
loyalty works because it's a relationship. It's about a, a customer's or a member's emotions, their attitudes, their behavior. It's about a relationship. And if we do them wrong, it's like doing somebody wrong in any other relationship in, in, in your life. There is a of which the brand suffers. Um, and in previous times, prior to this year, it might've been easy to go, well, we don't care about those customers. Well, guess what? They're the only customers that are there now. You've got to care about them. It's important. So I like the term that you use, total relationship. Um, just as we finish up, gentlemen, I want to talk about uh, the Lordy Summit coming online uh, later this year. Uh, I've got a slide here if I uh, can find it, get the technology working. Uh, obviously, I know everybody is keen to get back to business in person. Um, it's just not possible right now. Um, we don't want to wait all the way till next June, which is our next physical event at uh in washington dc at the conrad there beautiful property thanks to hilton uh for helping uh helping out with that one uh i'm certainly excited about that but in the meantime we want to make sure everyone has a chance to get together to talk loyalty uh to mingle with peers uh all the do it online um and we are very excited to announce we have three days uh, of events coming up uh in december one for europe uh, December 2 for the Americas uh, and December 4 for Asia Pacific. We have an absolute stellar uh, list of speakers uh, and guest panelists lined up. We're going to have more information on, uh, on, on, on those uh, panels and stuff as the agenda gets pulled together over the next couple of weeks. So please stay tuned to LinkedIn and uh, the Lord website, lordysummit.com for that. Um, uh, I believe both of you gentlemen are confirmed uh, as speakers to attend. I think, uh, Len, you're going to be joining us for the Americas event on December 2 and Alan uh, in Europe for December 1. Uh, yep. terrific we're looking forward to that uh, so please everybody do keep an eye on lordystuff.com keep an eye on LinkedIn I know everybody is a little bit zoomed out and a little bit uh, virtual presentation out and a little bit of virtual conference out uh, and I know it's busy conference season uh, that we're coming into right now uh, but we have got a, a really uh, a really fun platform uh, that's hopefully going to be very easy to use you're not going to have to watch a training video to be able to use it um, you know, things like pre-event meetup, virtual cocktail party looks very exciting, but also really easy to have um, discussions and networking opportunities with everybody, which, as we know, is really what these events are all about. We want to learn a little bit. We want to talk a little bit. We want to share some best tips, but also we want to have a chance to be able to meet and mingle with our colleagues from around the world that we don't get to see all the time uh, week to week. So hopefully everybody's going to be able to join us for that. Please stay tuned. Uh, and let me just go back to the dates for those. Block those out in your calendar. Uh, it's going to be super, super, super exciting. Uh, and I saw a bunch of emails in my inbox this morning with some 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 more speaker confirmation. So we're going to be able to uh, give everybody the details of that coming up the next week or two. Thank you very much uh, to our guests today, uh, Len Laguno and Alan Lias. Uh, guys, uh, fantastic. Thank you so Thanks, much David. for coming back on. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to get to speak to everybody again soon. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks a lot, David. All the best, everybody. Bye, Bye. now.